Dear auditors and friends, welcome. <clears throat> welcome to this very special training about the certificates on financial statements. My name is Gheorghe Bankos and I'm a Chartered and Certified Auditor from the Common Audit Service. The Common Audit Service is located in DG RNI Research and Innovation. The, and the Common Audit Service is managing all the second level audits for the Horizon 2020 framework. The purpose of this training is to improve the quality of the certificates financial statements or CFS or we will as we will call them uh, throughout this training and <clears throat> also the point would be to reduce <coughs> to reduce the possible differences between a um, CFS and uh, an EC audit. Okay, so let's see what we will discuss today. So the structure of this presentation is the following. First, we will uh, explain what it is the CFS. Then we will look at the most common errors that we found so far until the beginning of 2021 based on the audit results of the EC audits. Then we will look at the main eligibility criteria and the audit procedures for this. So we will cover uh, some procedures which are applicable for all the cost categories, then personal costs, subcontracting and other direct costs. Because this presentation is uh, quite long, so it's going to be, I estimate, maybe one hour and a half in total. We will split it in three parts. So in the first part, we will cover the introduction, the most common errors and the general procedures. In the second part, it's going to be the personal cost. And in the third part, it's going to be the subcontracting and other direct cost. So let's start. The most important link for you, it's this one where you can find the online manual for the certifications. <coughs> On this website, you find the template for the CFS, the template for the letter of representation for the CFS, the frequently asked questions, and if you still have further questions, you can raise them to the research inquiry service. Also, you'll find there the links to the grant agreement and to the annotated grant agreement for Horizon 2020. The annotated grant agreement, it's a award winning document, which is explaining very clearly all the requirements of the grant agreement with examples and exceptions and so on. I also put in the link to the indicative audit program, which the auditors from the commission and from the external audit firms they are using to perform the second level audits. This may be useful sometimes for you as a source of inspiration when you perform the CFS. But we will talk about this more at a later stage. So we have ex ante controls and ex post controls. In the ex ante controls, we have the certificate on the methodology and we have the large research infrastructure assessments. The ex post controls, they are composed of the CFS, which are the main purpose of this training. And we have the second level audits, which are in fact financial audits and investigation. And they may be launched by the court of auditors, by OLAF and by the common audit service by itself or by external audit firms. And for the first level audits for the CFS, the auditor is uh, selected by the beneficiary. For the CFS, the legal basis is Article 20.4 BEE, and there is a threshold of 325,000 euros. In this, we only include the declared actual cost and the unit cost calculated on the basis of the usual cost accounting practice. So this includes the average personal cost and the internal invoice. So the threshold doesn't include the indirect cost and the unit cost, which are calculated like for in the way like we have with flat rates, you know, for the Maris Lodoska Curie actions. Uh, it is required to have a certificate if this threshold is rich per beneficiary at the end of the action and must be submitted by the coordinator within 60 days after the end of the last reporting period. The certificate may cover the whole action or each reporting period separately. The CFS costs are eligible under the category cost for goods and services. 
the CFS is not an insurer assurance engagement, but an agreed upon procedures engagement. The auditors which they perform the CFS, they must be qualified auditors in accordance with this uh, Directive 43 from 2006. They must be independent and they must comply with the code of ethics for the professional accountants. However, there are two exceptions. For public bodies, they may use an independent public officer with formal competence to audit and international organization, they may appoint an internal or external auditor in accordance with its internal financial regulations and procedures. If you want to go straight to see the template for the CFS, you find it in this uh, link above. And inside you will see that uh, in the template it, you have two big parts, the terms of reference and the independent report of factual findings. So the terms of reference, it's a contract signed by the authorized representatives of the beneficiary or the linked third party and the auditor. In the independent report of factual findings is the report completed by the auditor, which includes a table of specific details to be verified as instructed by the European Commission. Now we get into more details what you find in the terms of reference. So this is the engagement of the auditor by the beneficiary. It's clarified the subject of the engagement, like the project, the cost audited, the responsibilities of the beneficiary and of the auditor, the applicable standards, the reporting, the timing, other terms like fees, liability, applicable law, and of course we have the date and signature of the auditor and beneficiary. In the auditor's independent report, we find 66 procedures covering all cost categories. For each of these procedures, the auditor needs to complete in the table C for confirm, meaning it is complying with what they need to check. There is an exception and then they need to, to explain the exception. And of course, the confirmation or the exception, they need to be based on the audit work and oral representations are not enough. And in case, for example, the beneficiary doesn't declare equipment costs, then of course the tests for uh, equipment are not applicable. So if that's the case, they will need to, to write not applicable for that section and to, to explain why. This also contains further remarks. And of course, this report is confidential and it should be used by the beneficiary and the commission agency only. There is also confirmation of no conflict of interest and it is mentioned the fee that it was paid and we also have a signature of the auditor. So let's look at the key differences between the CFS and the EC audits. So the CFS is the so-called first level audit and the EC audits are the second level audits. The CFS is an agreed upon procedures while the EC audits are assurance engagement. Therefore, which means that for the CFS, the auditor is not responsible for the suitability and pertinence of the procedures because they are set up by the Commission. While for the EC audits, there is an indicative audit program. However, the auditor remains the, the owner of the audit work and they can tailor the procedures performed. Um, the, another difference is that in the EC audits, we are also looking at the um, internal control system and this may lead to system recommendation which is not the case for cfs so this is not included in a, in a cfs as already mentioned like the ec audits they can be performed by the commission itself or by external audit firms appointed by the commission while the cfs it is performed by auditors which are selected by the beneficiary it is also different method you know how to to select this so for the ec audits we use a monitor unix sampling method and we top it off with a risk-based selection while for the cfs it is required to do a cfs when the threshold is reached <clears throat> and due to these differences the cfs doesn't lead to extrapolation while the ec audits they may lead to extrapolation of systemic and recurrent findings uh, found in them. 
However, there are also similarities. So both of the tools, they are ex post controls they pro that provide assurance to the authorizing officer on the eligibility of cost claim in the financial statements. The procedures between the two, they are quite similar. Therefore, also the documentation is quite similar. However, there are differences. So, for example, in the EC audits, we also have physical inspection for equipment. We are looking for the EU logo, for the JU logo, and we have interviews with some of the persons declared in personal cost. This is not the case with these procedures for the CFS. If, for example, you have a project with um, three periods and two are audited by the EC audits, then only the third period it should be included in the threshold for the CFS submission. So it may be that no CFS is required anymore. OK, so that was the introduction, what it is the CFS. Now we will look at the most common errors that we found so far based on the EC audits until beginning of 2021. So as you can see here, we have more or less almost 1,300 audits close so far with almost 3,000 participation. So even though these numbers, they, they are big numbers, you need to bear in mind that this is around 33% of the multi-annual goal for the Horizon 2020 audit strategy. What So what you will find in this, uh, in the next slide. So we have here only the negative adjustment because uh, it is considered that positive adjustments are not considered errors for this purpose. Also, the adjustments related to indirect costs are excluded because they are just a flat rate. And also, we removed the reclassifications between cost categories to be easier to, to look at the errors. As you would expect, most of the errors, they are in personal costs because this is the cost category where most of the costs are claimed. If you look here in total, in actual cost and in unit cost, we have only around all, almost 70% of the errors. Uh, I was following this type of presentation, you know, from some time and I have seen that uh, during the time, like the percentage of errors in personal cost has increased you can see that it's more errors in actual cost than in unit cost. This is for two main reasons. On one side, the unit cost is much less used, and on the other side, it's used the unit cost for uh, mostly big beneficiaries with a lot of projects, and they use the same methodology for, um, for all the cost um, declared, you know. So they know very well why they are doing. So that's one of the reasons why the, the errors are smaller. But let's look first at the actual cost. So as you would expect, there are three main areas where you can have errors. You can have issues with the productive hours. You can have issues with the remuneration cost, which is basically the pool of costs, which is based, you know, the calculation for the hourly rate calculation. And then you may have issues with the time claim or with the time sheets, depends how you want to call it. So of course, you may miss some uh, supporting documents and uh, there may be also issues with double, fun double funding. You see that there is quite a big portion of other errors, which okay, it, it was many of them with small percentages, so I didn't list them. If we look at unit cost, we see another type of error, which is that uh, indirect costs were claimed as direct costs. Let's see what's next. Next is subcontracting. Here we have, you see, 8% of uh, errors. And uh, this is a more risky area because even though in subcontracting it is not so many costs declared, statistically, when we have errors, they are big errors. Because, for example, if there is an issue with the best value for money or if the costs were not foreseen in Annex 1 nor agreed by the EU services or you are missing the documents, for example, then you will need to reject the whole cost item, which it can be quite big. So it's not like for personal cost that you make an adjustment for some hours or for you know some differences in the productive time calculation. Then in the other uh, cost, which okay, we will look at them like split in other direct goods and services, which is okay, let's say mostly consumables. 
then we will look at the equipment and the travel. So you will see that it's more or less the same um, type of errors, like lack of documents, cause not related to the action, or no direct measurement. So you see in equipment almost 5% of the errors and in travel around 2% of the errors, more or less the same source of errors. And in the meantime, the largest research infrastructure errors, they, they were significant enough to, to make sense to present them uh, separately. Okay, so this was the part about the most common errors that we found so far. The purpose of presenting that would be to, to help you to draw your attention to the more risky areas in the CFS. Now we will look at some general procedures which are applicable for all the cost categories. We will have a couple of slides dealing with the planning of the work, about the information requests, so the type of documents that you are using. It's going to be a very important discussion about the sample selection and then we will list the general eligibility criteria in the main type of audit tests. So let's see what type of documents are you requesting and what are you using to perform a CFS. So you will need a breakdown per reporting period with reference to financial years for each category of personal costs, which would mean, for example, like uh, employees, natural persons and so on. Then you will need for them the details for basic remuneration, complements and additional remuneration, the hourly rates calculation policy, then and then other policies like remuneration practices, usual cost accounting, procurement policy, travel policy, and of course the accounting records. What else? As George Clooney is saying, you look at the time recording system with some examples in the, you know, before you do the actual work and then you will review them in detail. You look at contracts, you will schedule meetings with the human resources, payroll, accounting, departments, time recording. And then, okay, you will do also some uh, payments tests, you know, you will look at pay slips, payroll, bank statements and contracts, for example. Now let's get to one of the most important parts, so that's the sample selection. So you see the sample, it's selected for each subcategory of costs, and it should be randomly selected as it, so that it is representative. If you have a population smaller than 10 items, then you need to test all the items. If you have more than 10 items, you still need to test at least 10 people or items, or 10% of the total number of items, so whichever number is the highest. So this is also one of the reasons why it may appear differences between the EC audits and the CFS audits, because the sampling methodology is not the same, and even if the methodology would be the same, due to this random nature of how we select the samples, it may be that it was not the same items included in the sample, even if it's the same methodology. And then on top for the EC audits, the procedures, I think they are more detailed. We go in more deep when we do this audit, so it's possible that we find more errors than they were found in the CFS. Okay, so now let's start with the general important things. So first we list uh, ineligible items. So all, all costs declared should not include these things, like costs related to return on capital, debt and debt service charges, provisions for future losses or debts, interest on doubtful debts, currency exchange losses, bank charges for incoming EU funds. Also, deductible VAT should not be included. Therefore, okay, you will look at the cost claim and you will look at the national law, tax declaration, the accounting system of the beneficiary. If you find e issues, you will need to, to address them. And here I would like to explain what it means adjustments on this slide. So as far as I understand, when you do a CFS, first the beneficiary say, look, this is what I have declared or this is what I want to declare. You do your 
audit work and then you see look i found these issues and then the beneficiary normally it's adjusting the claim to only declare what it is eligible and therefore many times in the cfs we don't have exceptions because the beneficiary adjusted the, the issues so here adjustments it's meant in the sense that you need to address these points or if the beneficiary doesn't want to adjustment adjust them you will need to uh, explain them as exceptions another general eligibility condition is that costs are actually incurred therefore for this purpose so you will look at uh, various documents like invoices you look at the accounting records like the general ledger and you will check that okay they included all the discounts all the rebates that the costs are paid or netted off and if there are issues you need to address them another generally general eligibility condition is that cost claim need to fall within the project period for this purpose you will check invoices delivery notes transport documents and you will need to pay special attention with the costs declared before the project periods because they may be related to kickoff kick meeting. So then they are um, still eligible or they may relate to the final reporting when they are still also eligible. So overall here you will look in the accounting records more or less and address the differences. Another general eligibility condition is that the beneficiary needs to comply with the national accounting standards and any digital documents, if they are used, must be allowed by the national law. So for this purpose, you will review the national law and the documents that you receive, and you may find interesting to review also the statutory audit reports to see if you find any relevant findings. 